Hi, my name is Sarah Burns, and I'm with the Low Incidence team with Alberta Education. And I'm here to introduce Sheila Moody, or Dr. Sheila Moody, um, with the uh, School of Communication Sciences and Disorders uh, with Western University. Um, she will be presenting on facilitating change in an individual's and or family behavior. Uh, Dr. Moody is an assistant professor at the Western University, and she's also a research associate at the National Center for Audiology. And her recent research interests have focused on how to use the knowledge uh, translation and implementation science frameworks during research projects um, to facilitate uh, change with individuals or families. Um, we will be, um, I just want to draw your attention to the, is it the chat line that the, you will be entering your questions for? And we will we'll be holding the questions until the end of the presentation, and, um, and then we can uh, go over them at the end with Dr. Moody. So, okay. Sorry, that's a little bit of a correction. There is a Q&A spot on the screen for you to enter your questions. We have Yvonne Nickel as our, our interpreter and uh, Sandra Burns as our captioner today. So without any further ado, I'd like to um, put the mic towards uh, Sheila and she'll do her presentation. Thank you, Sheila, for being here today. Hello, everyone. Hopefully my voice is loud enough for you and clear enough for you to all hear. <clears throat> if there's any problems, uh, I guess we'll just type them into the message line there and uh, we'll try and deal with them as we come up. So thank you for that kind introduction and I'm happy to be joining you here today um, at what I think is a very interesting topic. And um, what I would like to start by saying to you is that the things that I'm going to be presenting to you today really are just an introduction to this topic. Um, there's lots of things we can talk about, and, and I think you'll see by the end of it that there are lots of things to learn. And so I see this as an introduction to um, hopefully our relationship building and something that we can continue to work on together. Some of it may be new. All of it may be new to some of you. Um, parts of it may be new to some of you, but I hope what you'll find at the end is that it's interesting to all of you and that you'll be able to see how it could be applied in your practice when you're working with individuals and or families. Um, one of my interests is in family-centered early intervention, and on this slide you'll see both my email and my lab website. And so you could go to the lab website and maybe find some resources there that are helpful to you. But always, I encourage you to please email me if you have questions or you hear something interesting that I'm talking about today that you'll want to learn more on because we really only have, you know, one hour together to cover a lot of material. Next slide, please. So I looked at um, your website and I um, came up with some desired outcomes based on that. So I would really like to assist in the understanding at the system level that considerations of capability, opportunity, and motivation can be used to deliver equitable services that are effective and efficient. And I also want to underscore the importance of collaborative continuing education opportunities. So these are new ways to practice that are coming down the pipe for many of us, and we need continuing education opportunities to be able to take advantage of them. And collaborative practice to implement this revised understandings of best practice in pediatric rehabilitation, and also in family-centered early intervention. And I also wanna educate attendees here today about new considerations so that we can enable and ensure appropriate supports for students families, our colleagues, and systems. We all know it's important to talk, uh, to talk to each other using common language that we understand. And so hopefully we can support a dialogue and conversation and start that today um, that I'm hoping will continue um, for a long period of time to come. 
So as I develop this presentation, I realize again that it will be an introduction for you or perhaps a new way of thinking. And I'm happy to and I hope that we will continue our discussions. Next slide, please. So again, um, this visual, which I took off the RCSD website, and which I know may not be in use anymore because websites are things that change, things become obsolete, and they don't always get updated. But um, I wanted to look at the fact that this already talks about the importance of considering capability, that's support for functional needs, and opportunity, support for environmental access. It doesn't address clearly how motivation might be used and hopefully I'll talk today about that and you consider how and you can consider over time how it fits into this framework because motivation is necessary for success in terms of behavior implementation or change So my agenda is to introduce you to a way that you can bring about behavior change and or behavior development. Again, it is an introduction and you might feel that at the end of the hour that it was a lot of information. So if you remember nothing else, um, do what I first did when I first started learning about the science of behavior change. I asked myself, and I'm gonna talk to you about this today. When you're looking at someone's behavior, and when you're thinking about, you know, why are they doing the things that they do or what reason or rationale do they have to do the things they do? Um, I say to myself, is the issue here capability? Is it opportunity? Or is it motivation? It might be a combination. But you can look and think about um, how these three components can affect behavior. And then you can figure out how you might go about developing an intervention to target that level. And I'm going to talk to you more about that. I always like to say, what could you implement on Monday? And the capability, opportunity, motivation question is something you can start with right away. Um, when I first started learning about it, I found that I quickly moved into using it with my young people in my house. <laughs> so when my teens came home and I was like, why are they doing that? I would say to myself, Hmm, is that capability, opportunity, or motivation? And it came, I used it so often that sometimes the kids say to me today, Mom, don't come be me. I would say that capability, opportunity, and motivation affects um, behavior. And this model can be used to bring about not only um, individual or family behavior, but I think you can see how it might be applied to organizational change. So this conversation today is important, hopefully, for clinicians and for managers. If you're really interested, I'll, I've put some references at the end of the presentation that will be helpful for you. And you can also email me, and my email address is on the first page of the slides. Next slide, please. Here's the problem. If we measure at assessment or at other times, what is wrong with this person and what can I do for them, then we might miss the boat in terms of being client or family centered. The question should be, who is this person and what do they need? The problem is our healthcare context doesn't provide us with the time to practice this way, which I probably don't need to tell you folks. But I would argue um, it is not cost effective or patient centered to not practice this way. Because what happens is we end up going in circles and not changing behavior, not understanding why it's occurring, trying something different, trying something different again. And that really is not a cost effective way to practice. I remember many years ago doing a study where we asked people now in their late 30s or early 40s to tell us about their experiences as young people in the triad of care between their audiologist, their parents, and themselves. So these are kids that were growing up in the, um, in the care system, and they were too young to come to the appointments by themselves. Um, 
And as, as they grew up and became more autonomous, one young person said in our interviews, I am more than a hearing loss. Appointment after appointment, we often treat the impairment or the problem, but don't always meet with success because we don't deal with the participation issues and or the environmental issues and or the system level issues. Next slide, please. So the problem is that pediatric rehab is moving towards the adoption of system views of the complex array of factors and processes that influence client change. But the field still operates predominantly from a unidirectional medical perspective where something is provided to fix the client rather than operating from a more contemporary realist views of change as an evolving cascading phenomenon that can be mobilized by intervention. So I would argue that this is true for any type of rehabilitation, even though this quote from um, Dr. King is about pediatric rehab, but it's true for any type of rehab, any type of family system intervention. And really when you think about some of the changes we have at the organization level that needs to be done, we often do the same thing, right? We try to fix. Um, rather than figure out what is, what is the complex array of factors that is in processes that are causing the problem and which might influence change. Next slide. So we're going to start, we're going to get started. I'm going to start with you first, um, talking about the international classification of functioning, disability, and health. So that's the ICF. And then I'm going to talk to you about, at the same time, the child and youth version, the ICF-CY. So this is a, put out by the World Health Organization. So if you're not familiar with these two um, frameworks or models, I encourage you to become familiar with you. I'm going to introduce you to them today. I want to give you two references that you can look at and read about um, to get a general understanding um, because I think they're really important to how we want to practice. And they're really important when we think about who is this person and what do they need. Next slide, please. So this figure is from an article that I wrote with my colleague Marlene Bogato in 2016. And basically, it's the visual representative, the center part of the ICF. So the ICF looks at body functions, activities, and participation, and tries to figure out, you know, how the environmental factors fit in there and how personal factors fit in there to um, impact overall function or disability. So disability is a consequence of people with impairment or illness encountering restricted opportunities. So it's important to focus on developing or finding, ensuring opportunities are afforded by the environment so that people can be what they wish to be and do what they wish to do. That's sort of an overarching way of looking at this ICF. We spend much of our clinical time focused on the one square, body functions or impairment, and ignoring all the other squares in this visual. But if we truly want to provide equitable supports and services, we must look at all the other squares and their impact on function and disability. So the opportunities afforded to a person to be and do the activities they wish to participate in, the environmental and personal factors are all transactional. So what that means is they change as people change across the course of their lifespan. So you can see outside of that, I talk about human development across time. So these are things that aren't static. So the things that a child participates in that are important in their everyday life at even six months of age are going to be different when they become more mobile at one year of age. So a person can experience a high quality of life and have an impairment, and many, many do. 
That is in part because they are participating in activities that are valuable to them and participating in an equitable way. So we need to ensure that more individuals experiencing an impairment have this opportunity so that experience and participation are equitable. And that is in part why it is important to have these conversations at the system level. This kind of practice takes time and training and it takes new ways to have conversations. For example, I am currently learning how to use motivational interviewing and solution-focused coaching more because they are both useful tools in facilitating behavior change. But developing these skills takes time and you know, people have to pay for that time and pay for the money. So it's important that we think at the system level that these things are important because if we are going to change to this new way of practice, it's going to take time and experience and opportunity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is a little bit more complicated slide. So you can see in the left-hand side, you can see it's still that boxes of the ICF, CY, because it's a child. But you see now I've added another section up at the top because kids don't live by themselves. They live in a family context. So um, if you're gonna think about the, how this child is gonna have activities and participation and how they're gonna experience and, and um, take opportunities and blossom um, as they grow up, you have to think about how the parent is functioning within this context. So the parent and the child are inextricably linked and we have to be able to deal with the parent's activities and participation and their body function. So maybe they've become depressed, for example, because their child has a disability. We have to deal with both of these things and we have to think about both of these things. And so the nice thing about this model is it allows us to start to think about what are the factors that could be happening in this child's and family's life that is either contributing to behaviors or causing behaviors or limiting behaviors, and we can start to piece all of these things out. Next slide, please. So this comes from an article I wrote in 2018. So I've been thinking about this for a while and trying to build it over time to think about how can I teach clinicians about all of these kind of things. And so when we think about the parenting in context, we have to think about not only the child, do that doing, being, becoming, and belonging are impacted by the transactional nature of the family context, as well as life-changing context. So let's look first at the list of favorable outcomes. So if you look at their empowerment and knowledge, child well-being, family well-being, for example, self-determination, I wonder how many of these desired outcomes we measure in practice. But if we ask our children or families what their desired outcomes of intervention are would be, this is the kind of list that, that we would likely get from them in many times. So if we treat and intervene on what we measure and we don't measure any of this, guess what we treat? Only the body function or the impairment. Now I will say that we don't have great ways to effectively and efficiently measure some of these desired outcomes. But I think rehabilitation is moving towards the development of better ways of measuring and intervening. Well-being, for example, is one of the areas getting a great deal of attention right now. Children and parents live in context, family context and systems context, and that is important to remember. So the parenting in context, some of their environmental factors, for example, um, social support or the family's attitudes of environments to a child's dif disability, 
can affect the environmental factors of the child. So there's this back and forth that goes on between the parent and the child. And so when you have a child with an impairment, you have to understand how parenting is happening in context. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So we must understand more than the impairment, activity limitations and participation restrictions of the child, we must understand the child's everyday life situations and the context of their everyday, in this case, listening situations or their everyday life situations. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm giving you an introduction to the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. And I think that's an important place to start our conversation today before I move into other models that I really wanted to share with you. Because again, it's a pretty straight, it looks complicated, but it's actually a fairly straightforward model to start to implement into practice. So now I want to move to what I'm gonna call the COMB model, because it's the newer um, behavior change theory that's out there that I wanted to introduce you to if you have not heard of it before. It's being used frequently and lots within disability um, work and rehabilitation right now. Um, and it's being shown to be a very um, structured and well-organized way to look at behavior, to look at behavior change to look at in developing interventions that will lead to successful behavior change. Next slide, please. So within a capability and behavioral change theory framework, disability is understood to be a limitation of opportunities that results from the interactions between an individual's impairment or an illness in concert with their personal characteristics, their available resources, and their environment. And so then again and again, you will see this in this kind of literature coming up over and over again. It's not just about the person. It's about resources. It's about environment. It's about opportunities afforded to them. Next slide, please. So what is important about participation? This is, a, a, this is not my work. This, is, um, this work comes from Karen um, Hamill. It's called Karen w Wally Hamill. And she's at the University of British Columbia. Um, I'd love to spend a lot of time talking to her one day because I think she's a really interesting um, person and researcher. And I le love to read a lot of her stuff. So she would be someone that I would encourage you to to look up if you're interested in and to engage with um, her literature. So one of the articles that I read recently about hers that I'd like to make you um, bring to your attention and make you remember is she talks about things like what is important about participation. And I want you to remember this slide because I use this kind of slide when I'm starting to think about questions I might ask my teens who are doing things that I want to better understand. So I'm going to talk to you at the end about a case example of what if the teen stops wearing their assistive listening device? So what is it about, what is important to them about participation that might encourage them to change their behavior and put that device back on, for example? One of the things we're gonna talk about a little bit is about autonomy or a sense of choice of control. We all know teens want it and we need to understand how to help them get it and have choice, but also understand the repercussions or the consequences of their decisions. Participation builds competence and accomplishment through doing. It leads to belonging, acceptance, safety and respect. It provides the ability and opportunity to do and to engage personally in meaningful, valuable activities. It provides the ability and opportunity to contribute to the well-being of self and others. 
to support and do things for others, and engage in meaningful and reciprocal relationships that build social connections and social engagement, and ultimately inclusion. So when we think about doing things so that our children and families can participate, it's not just about having them do something. It's about all of these other things that are products of being able to participate. Next slide, please. So the center of behavior change work is simply a behavior system, the COMB system in this case, that proposes that for any behavior to occur, the person performing the behavior needs to have the physical and psychological capability to perform the behavior, the social and physical opportunity to perform the behavior, and the more motivated to perform the target behavior than any other behavior in the moment in time that the target behavior is performed. So the COMB framework or model proposes that intrapersonal capability and motivation and environmental opportunity influences on behavior interact in that capability, opportunity, and motivation influence behavior. Capability and opportunity influence motivation, and behavior influences all three components. Right? So if, you have, if you're doing a behavior and you're doing it capably and you're having lots of opportunity to do it, wow, you're probably going to be more motivated to do it over time. So this is, this is a, a system that all works together, and it's a system that works from behavior to capability, opportunity, and motivation, or vice versa. So a behavior change intervention is defined as a single or multiple sessions of motivational discussion focused on increasing the individual's insight and an awareness regarding specific health behaviors and their motivation to change. Next slide, please. So physical and psychological capability is the ability to be capable to enact behavior, right? So do they have the skills? Do they have the knowledge? Do they have the self-confidence? Physical and social environment um, that enables or supports the opportunity to perform the um, behavior. So do the people have physical and social, in, um, sorry, does the individual have the physical and social environment that enables or supports the opportunity to perform the behavior? And of course, we know that motivation sometimes is automatic. So sometimes is autonomous or self-endorsed or internal, and sometimes is more reflective. So physical capability refers to having the necessary skills and physical abilities to perform the behavior, while psychological capability refers to the required knowledge and mental capacity to perform it. Having the required physical ability to walk to school is an example of capability. Social and physical opportunity are defined as all factors that lie outside the person performing the behavior, and that makes the behavior possible or prompted. So the presence of appropriate and easy to see markers along the path to school and appropriate signage for drivers are examples of physical opportunity for walking to school. Ensuring that businesses in the area make um, education or educate their customers about the safe walking paths is part of the social circle that we can use to be provide social opportunity for doing so. And motivation refers to the cognitive processes that energize and direct a behavior and includes reflective motivation, such as conscious decision-making, I'm going to walk to school, as well as automatic motivation, such as habits or emotional responses. I'm going to address my anxiety around walking to school. So that really is just 
um, a very quick sort of explanation of behavior change theory and a very easy way to you, for you to start to think about how would I apply this in my work? So you would, you know, you'd apply it by first saying, it, you know, is the target behavior, is it something they're capable of? Do they have the opportunities to do it? Is there something I need to do around helping them become motivated to do it? So, and then there are ways, which I'm going to talk about towards the end of the presentation, of looking at each of these areas and asking appropriate questions about them. Next slide, please. So our behaviors are influenced by psychology and context. So another theory that's interested um, for you guys to know about, if you don't already know, is the bioecological theory of development um, by Bronfenbrenner. Nice long name there. And that posits, again, that human development is transactional. It changes over time, in which an individual's development is influenced by his or her interactions with various aspects and spheres of their environment. So when we talk about opportunity, um, and when we talk about capability, and we know that these families don't, um, it's not about just about the child, and it's not just about the family. It's about how those, that um, system or community functions in larger systems to um, in ensure that this child is um, going to develop to their optimum potential and this family is going to develop to their optimum potential as well. All right, next slide. So when whether parents can perform effectively in their child rearing roles within the family depends on the role demands, stresses, and supports emanating from other settings. Parents' evaluations of their own capacity to function, as well as their view of their child, are related to such external factors as flexibility of job schedules, adequacy of childcare arrangements, presence of friends and neighbors who can help out, the quality of health and social services, and the neighborhood safety. So if we only look at the impairment, or we only look at the um, family and wonder why they're not doing something, as clinicians, we often become very sort of judgmental about why they're not doing what we've asked them to do, right? Things would be better if they just, you know, put those hearing aids on the child as soon as he got up in the morning and had them on their ears all day long. To understand why they might not be doing that, we have to understand the context in which they're parenting. And we have to understand the challenges that they're facing or the, in regards to opportunity and sometimes, you know, motivation in order to help them develop the skills and help them see how they can um, change over time to be able to effectively implement um, what, what we would hope would be beneficial to both the child and the parents. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start by talking to you more about opportunity, right? Capability, opportunity, motivation. So I'll start with capability. So again, Karen Wally Hamill at UBC suggests we query ourselves. Do their circumstances actually allow them to do and be what they wished? That's opportunity. So understanding opportunity in terms of capability which I'll talk about next, allows us to determine whether a person is able to do the things she or he would value doing and whether their circumstances actually allow them to do what they would like to do. <clears throat> so having a good understanding of the social determinants of health is important when we think about opportunity. There should and must be equality of opportunity. 
In order for an individual or family or community to realize their potential, there must be contexts which enable optimal opportunity for participation. And we need to understand the socially structured inequalities that may exist at an economic, institutional, cultural, political, legal, or religious level that may limit the achievement of opportunity. For example, health literacy. So sometimes we give people pamphlets and we do this often with our teens, but we don't have, often ask ourselves to look closely at the literature we want them to read and ask ourselves, does the teen actually have a health literacy level that understand, helps them enable or understand the repercussions of their behavior? Do we measure that? Do we measure health literacy? Not very often. And there are ways to, to measure it. Are we sure that we use language and conversation that enables them to understand how opportunity is affected by their behavior? Or do we just lecture them, tell them what they should be doing? I think more often than not, we, we fall back on lecturing because we don't have the skill set often to actually take them down a motivational um, interview kind of opportunity opportunity to help them understand and help us understand where the behavior is coming from. The other problem is, <clears throat> excuse me, the other problem is that we're not often given the time within the clinical context to have these very, very important conversations. But over and over again, what we're seeing from the benefits of um, a calm B kind of approach to working with people is that it actually is more cost effective in the long run because you're actually able to determine where you should intervene rather than keep coming back over and over and over again to try something new. So in my practice, I find that there are several reasons that teens stop wanting to use their DM systems. Um, they feel unsure that the teacher wants to wear the mic they don't feel comfortable explaining it to their friends. Um, they're tired of having to deal with the hassle of charging or remembering to bring it to class. So these are the systems, these are the uh, assistive hearing device systems. And sometimes I just ask them, what do you already know about having the opportunity to wear this hearing assistive device? because they may already know about all the opportunities and reasons why they need to wear it and telling them about why they need to wear it isn't taking us down the right path. So you could also say to them, I'm concerned about this decision that you're making. May I share why? And that's one of the things that um, I think is sort of interesting about the motivational interviewing approach is because it teaches you to ask permission to share information. And if the person says no, they don't want it, then we're to respect that information, that decision, and take a different path to try and offer them the information. The, infra the interesting thing to remember is that opportunity can affect motivation. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend very much time on this slide, but this is another slide from um, Gillian King's work. And it really says living a meaningful life is important. And that you can um, develop behaviors and develop uh, strategies for different environments and contexts that will allow you to um, use resiliency and facilitate processes that actually help to at a cumulative and cascading positive experience across multiple contexts. And that's what we want for our kids. And that's what we want for our families. So let's talk next, next slide, about capability. So capability is about the individual family or community 
having the physical strength, knowledge, and skills, and stamina to perform the behavior. They must have the freedom and opportunity to choose what they wish to do and to be, and the opportunities to act on these wishes. In other words, are people able to do the things that they would value doing, and do their circumstances actually allow them to do and be what they want to? Next slide. And finally, motivation. Um, the individual or the family or the community must be more highly motivated to do the behavior than not to do it or to engage in a competing behavior. If people are to be motivated, then they need to believe that there is a reasonable possibility that their choice might be transformed into a desired outcome or action and that it is likely to increase the capability. So your next slide, please. So this slide is adapted from an article by Chaim et al. And ju that's just come out recently. And the reason I want to bring it to your attention is because <clears throat> we can try and affect motivation in a variety of ways. So we can affect motivation in a situational sense. So in this situation, what is happening? We can um, affect it in a contextual sense, so a broader sense. And our ultimate goal is that the person would internalize, have internalized motivation to do a behavior. And what we know from self-determination theory is that, which is self-determination theory is a theory of human motivation that has demonstrated efficacy. Um, it, it emphasizes the importance of the kind of motivation that drives people's behavior alongside considerations of how much they are motivated. So what self-determination theory says, that the satisfaction of the needs for autonomy, choice, individual choice or personal choice, competence, feeling able to do something, and relatedness, the social support, the support of kind of network, mediates the associations between autonomous motivation and behavioral persistence um, in multiple contexts, including health behavior change. So what we want to be able to do is to, to move people in terms of motivation from away from being um, amotivated, so not having any motivation, to externally motivated. So they've got some motivation. It might be um, some an external kind of impact on that, but leading eventually to an internalized motivation. And we do know that motivation affects how you feel about yourself or how you feel about something that you want to do. It often affects your ability to cognitively feel like you can do it, to think that you can do that behavior and actually perform the behavior. So the interesting thing about this slide is that it works back and forth, right? I've got these double arrows going on here. Because if you feel like you can't do it, then why would you be internally motivated to try and do something? Because you're worried that you're going to fail at it. So being motivated is um, a very important part of the calm B. And, we'll, and you often find that this is the one area that people over and over and over again um, sort of need help with in terms of interventions. Next slide, please. So when we think about uh, behavior change, there are, according to the work done by <clears throat> this group out of the uh, UK who are the leaders in terms of the science of behavior change, there are sort of 14 kind of um, principles, places where you can go to think about um, intervening 
to help with the behavior change. So do they have the knowledge? Do they have the skills? Do they have social or professional role or identity? Beliefs about their capabilities, beliefs about the consequences, goals, memory, attention, and decision processes, environmental context and resources, social influences, emotion, behavioral regulation, optimism, intentions, and reinforcement. So the nice thing about the work that's coming out of the behavioral sciences and the behavioral change science is that we have a lot of people thinking about how you can intervene in these 14 kind of ways. Next slide, please. So when you hear people talking about COM B, you'll often hear them say about the COM B wheel. And this, I'm just showing you this so that when, if anyone calls it a wheel to you, you'll know what they're talking about. And basically, <clears throat> what the COM B wheel says in the, in the green part, you'll see capability, opportunity, and motivation. And you can see the physical and psychological things that I've already talked to you about. And then as you move out, it gets broader and broader and broader, saying that you can change um, a person's behavior. You can use any of these intervention functions, such as persuasion or modeling or coercion. And coercion actually works sometimes. But you can also look at the, the gray area on the outside. You can change behavior by policy categories. So having good policy actually can help individuals change their behavior. As an example, um, I've written some clinical practice guidelines. And when the colleges say the guidelines will be put into practice and the clinicians will use those guidelines, they will often be used because that's a form of motivation, isn't it? That's a form of changing someone's behavior because there's actually potential for a desired outcome from a policy level if they don't, right? So there's different ways you can uh, uh, change someone's behavior. Regulation's one of them. Legislation's another. So that you can see how this can work at multiple different levels. Next slide, please. This slide here is just to show you um, as we've talked today, hopefully I'm introducing you to a new way of thinking about things. Susan Mitchie and her colleagues at um, University College in London have this tool that I've provided you the link to. And they've provided a list of 74 behavior change techniques that can be coupled with 26 different ways put, to put them in action. So I encourage you as you start to think about how would I implement this very, what seems like a very complex subject into practice, go ahead and play with that tool. Because what it will say is, are you looking at capability? And here's different ways you can um, target capability. And there's a nice little tool that will give you different ideas in there. So I encourage you to try that out. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it today. But again, if you want to learn more about it, I'm happy to, to, to uh, walk through that with you. Next slide, please. So just so that you can see that this kind of COM B behavior model and behavior change wheel is being used in clinical practice and in research now. So Fiona Barker and her colleagues use this model of behavior and the behavior change wheel to develop an intervention to improve hearing aid use in adult oral rehabilitation. So they looked at all the factors that were affecting the behavior, and then they used the COMBI model and that, that uh, theory and technique tool to determine ways to change their behavior um, around hearing aid use. And there's lots of other examples as well 
um, that are out there uh, related to all kinds of things. And you know, and I know, um, it's really hard to change your behavior, right? I've been on a sabbatical this year. I started in January and I'm going back to work full time in January. And over that course of the year, I was like, I'm going to change all these behaviors. Like I'm going to exercise every day. I exercised every day for some days and then I stopped exercising. So even your own behavior and I can calm be myself. So <laughs> there you go. It's not easy to change. <laughs> so I'm going to go through two case examples. One that I've put in here and then another one that I had talked with Sarah about that I don't have slides in, um, but, but, we, but I'll still talk to you about it in the last uh, 10 minutes that we have together. So the first example I'll talk to you about is a case example of capability, opportunity, and motivation around the parents of an infant newly diagnosed with hearing impairment. So the parents have the hearing aids. They, we think they know how to put them on but they're not having the child wear them all waking hours. So one would think, you know, that this would be highly valuable to the parents. So as clinicians, we try to, we say to ourselves, you know, why aren't the parents putting the hearing aids on? And it's our job to figure that out. So um, my PhD student, David Sindri, which some of you may know because he's been around for a long time, but now he's working on his PhD. So anyone who's ever done um, the listening games for littles, for example, um, would know of David Sindri, for example. So his work, his PhD work was to take the combi model, take this um, framework of understanding behavior and figure out for example, why parents weren't keeping hearing aids on all waking hours, and he developed an intervention that um, we're going to use to target behavior change for parents. So if any of you are interested in, in this, you'll find all of the, this 12 video series on the Family Centered Early Intervention website that can be used in practice. So next slide. So for example, this one is just showing parents, the top one will show them that by the time a child is one year of age, a typically hearing child will hear about 7.6 million words. And um, a child whose parents aren't really talkative may only hear about 2.2 million words. So we want them to put the hearing aids on and we want them to be really talkative. But if a child is late to get hearing aids and they um, don't have talkative parents, they may only hear like 1.7 million words. So that's a big difference. So these are, this is a, a sort of way of introducing parents to what we would say salience of consequence. <laughs> so this is a consequence, but also to educate them, to try and motivate and persuade them so there's different ways that we can try and target behavior. Um, and in the videos, we don't just use one. Sometimes we use three or four different interventions under the hood to try and help our parents um, develop new behaviors or change their behavior. So those were just some salience of consequence, um, looking at their knowledge level, trying to persuade them of um, changing behavior, but we have a whole other video that says, maybe you know all of this, but you just don't have strategies to keep your hearing aids on this baby who keeps pulling them out of their ears. So we also have to understand that that might be an issue for them. And we've developed um, some strategies around that as well. The second, you can just leave this slide up for now. The second um, case example that I wanna talk to you about Let's go back to that um, teenager who doesn't want to wear their um, hearing assistance technology remote microphone at school. And I think in Alberta, my understanding is we might call it a DM. Okay. So they've decided they're not going to wear it anymore. And this is not an uncommon problem. Um, it seems to happen all the time. And what do we do about it? So what we've found is that many cases like these, 
the use of motivational interviewing techniques could be helpful. Um, and uh, so that's one of the reasons I would like you to encourage you to think about that. So one of the things I've learned, questions I've learned to ask from my friends who uh, do motivational interviewing is just to say to them, I'm curious to know more about why you not wear it, why you don't want to wear it anymore, right? So coming at it from a curiosity perspective is, as opposed to why aren't you doing this, helps to open an ability to have a conversation with them. We need to understand why it's valuable or what is valuable to you about being able to participate in class, because then you can build on those values to, under, to help them understand the advantages of doing it. And one of the things I think we don't do enough is to look to see if the teen actually understands what stigma is. When I looked at the literature, I didn't see a lot of literature out there that said teens understand what stigma is. They experience it, but they're not always good about explaining what it is to them. So a lot of the behavior change theories will help along that. Okay, I'm just going to um, try and wrap up here shortly. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So there's much to learn about facilitating behavior change. The good news is there are great researchers out there who are trying to put it into understandable language that clinicians can use and that organizations can use. And I'd like to encourage you that to remember that you cannot be what you need to be by remaining what you are. So we need to try and adopt some of these new approaches to practice so that we can be what we need to be for the families and children we serve. Thank you very much. The next couple of slides, which you, I think you'll get these handouts, will have some references um, that you can uh, refer to. And please let me know if there's anything you heard about today you wanna know about more. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moody. Um, this is Sarah Burns. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm able to read, if you can write, type them out, I'll read them to Dr. Moody. Um, that was a great overview. And if anybody's ever tried to not bite your nails, <laughs> I think the calm mess method might be effective for this. Um, and we are having ongoing conversations about how to work with teenagers. And I think the suggestion of examining motivations is right up there with uh, all the other suggestions that we have uh, gathered over the last few weeks. So thank you so much. It's very timely. So I'm not seeing any questions from anybody. Is it? I'm just going to check and see if there's anything that came through the chat. Is yes, certainly chat? People, people are free to, and I welcome you to email me. Um, certainly the whole self-determination theory approach, um, you know, autonomy, relatedness, competence, is really a nice approach for working with our team. Um, but we also have to have the language to be able to um, engage them in conversation. And I find the motivational interviewing approach is really a nice way of trying to engage them in conversation. Um, but it does require a lot of practice um, to be able to be good at it. And I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in it. I would love to be an expert in it, and I hope to become an expert in it. Um, but there certainly are people who are. I have a, a colleague here at Western named Jennifer Irwin, who uh, has been using it for years uh, very successfully. That's good to hear because sometimes when you're working with teenagers, the lack of success often makes you feel or question your, 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 your methodology. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm glad that the opportunity to learn new ways of doing this is, is, is available to us. Thank you, Dr. Moody. I'm not seeing any questions. I'm seeing some positive comments about the, your presentation. Thank you so much. I'll reach out to you um, regarding some other things that you've shared with me. Thank Perfect. you.
Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you, Vaughn.